Hello and welcome to the next webinar in the series brought to you by Strengthening the Heartland. I'm Amber Letcher. So happy to see so many of you with us this morning for a really great presentation. I'm going to go through a few housekeeping items just to give you a few instructions and then I will turn it over to our speakers for today. Um, first of all, if you uh, have noticed in your uh, platform, you should see a handout section. So if you'd like to follow along with today's presentation, there are handouts there for you. Um, if you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to type those into the chat. We'll save some time at the end to answer those, uh, but you can type those in at any time. And then you'll also see a short survey link there um, after we get done. If you would take a couple minutes just to give us your uh, background so we know who is joining us today and then we also love to hear your recommendations for future webinars so um, i think that is everything with that i'm going to turn it over to our speakers for today welcome uh, dr heather Dahl and dr wendy hoskins hello everybody thank you so much for joining us today today we're going to talk about how to assess and respond to suicidality in youth Before we get started with the presentation, Heather and I both really want to say thank you to each of you who are attending today um, or who will be looking at this later. We know that everyone is already doing so much and we know that if you're here, you're probably already checking on children and adolescents in your communities, in your homes, in your schools which means you are also already part of the solution. So thank you for what you're already doing to help our children and youth. We can't do it without you. Um, so just keep that in mind as we go through today. Yes, and so today, let's just go over a few of the objectives that we're going to have for this webinar. Um, we're gonna talk about initial thoughts surrounding suicide. Um, so we're going to give you some basic statistics. Um, we're going to talk about cultural awareness and values. We're going to go over risk factors and protective factors. We're going to talk about how you might intervene and some resources for you before you leave today. Um, so before we get started, we just want to talk about these initial thoughts. Um, many of us here in the room have already been affected by suicide in our lives. Uh, when you're talking to someone that or youth that might be suicidal, don't be afraid to ask if you're concerned about someone. Um, it's always better to intervene and make that initial step and maybe be wrong um, than it is to not ask. When you're talking about suicide, make sure you use plain language and be specific in your conversations with the person. Um, we know that those who attempt or complete suicide have often exhibited some form of helping help seeking behaviors at one time that might be asking for help. There might be some more indirect conversations with somebody, but they're all uh, at one point or another. There's some form of helping help seeking behavior. And as stressful as it is, you may be the first person um, to reach out to someone for that person who's exhibiting help seeking behaviors. Um, we also know that suicide risk factors are varied, complex, and individualized. No one person is going to look the same when presenting with suicidality, um, which can be a little scary. So we're gonna go over some things today to um, help differentiate a little for you. The first thing we want you to be thinking about and sitting with a little bit today is our cultural awareness and values and how they relate to how we talk about, think about, feel about mental health and wellness. So two categories here. One is really thinking about your schools, your community centers, wherever you're working with youth, thinking about building a culture within that space that really supports the idea of mental health and wellness. Often we hear mental health and we think mental illness. And when we think mental illness, we think really sick and we want to hide that or shame that. And we're still working on changing that lens, right? 
but we have to do it. We have to say it's okay to talk about our mental health. We have to say it's okay to be thinking about our wellness in a um, way that will help promote that for others to be willing to talk about it themselves. So within your spaces that you work and you live, encourage the right to seek mental health support. It's okay to ask for help. Identify safe spaces. So a safe space can also be a safe person within your building. So when I worked as a school counselor, for instance, my office was a safe space. You could say anything you wanted without judgment in that space, right? Maybe it's a school counselor, a school social worker, a teacher. Maybe you're running a youth group right, or you're in charge of a Girl Scout troop or 4-H, something like that. How do you identify as a safe space and a safe person? Also, many of you might be caregivers who also need support, right, when finding out that a child that you have or a child that you're working with is experiencing those suicidality and those suicidal thoughts. As a caregiver, as a safe space person, we need to remember to seek out our own mental health and wellness and that talking about that is okay. The second piece here I want you to be thinking about is being sensitive to an individual child's culture and their views on mental health and suicide. You might have a positive view of seeking out mental health and wellness, but maybe the child that you're working with, they've been taught in their home, in their community, maybe their church, that it's not okay to talk about mental health with people outside of their circle. Um, it might not be okay to talk about mental health at all. Either you're happy and doing fine, or you need to go deal with it and come back later. Right? I certainly grew up with those messages. We still have some of those messages today. So think about how do we become open um, and make sure that children know that they have someone who they can talk to about these issues. Maybe we need to broach their values. Maybe there's different value sets there. And also acknowledging today our racialized and historical trauma that we may have some children and families still experiencing, still dealing with. How does that affect their mental health and wellness or their values around mental health? And also a family history. If there's been a history of suicide in a family, how did that family deal with that? And those people in that family can also affect how a student or a child responds. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about just some basic statistics regarding suicide in youth. Um, so right now, it's the second leading cause of death for those 10 to 24 years of age. Um, it's a rate of for every 3.4 um, per 100,000 deaths. Um, there are racial disparities in the United States regarding suicide attempts in youth. Uh, African-American youth ages 12 and younger are more likely to die by suicide than their white peers. And rates of suicide in indigenous youth ages 10 to 24 are 3.4 times higher than the national average. And when we talk about suicide, we're not just talking about completing. We're also talking about those who have made attempts. And for every adolescent that dies by suicide, it's estimated that 100 to 200 have made an attempt. Okay, so now we wanna hear from you. We want you to do a little brainstorming here. You can use the chat function um, to respond to this query. What are some risk factors that you can think of for suicide with children and adolescents? What's a risk factor? Okay, we have a few coming in here. Looks like bullying, um, lack of social support, poverty, um, previous attempts, yep. SES, yep. social isolation, substance use, um, trauma, previous trauma. Mm -hmm. it, yes, to all of those. Yeah. Right, Heather? 
Yeah, I feel like they just did our next slide for us, which is That's good. right. Yeah, we can skip ahead. Awesome. So when we talk about risk factors, that really refers to factors that can contribute to the increased risk of suicide. Um, we have a handout. I think it's in your handouts that you received today, and I'm going to show you a picture of it in the slide. Um, and it's really a... Um, not all encompassing because like we talked about earlier in the slides that suicide risk is individualized and can look different for different youth and um, adults anyone we're talking about that's at risk for suicide but these are some pretty common um, suicide risk factors that we can look at so let's look at this um, handout so we look at this really in three levels at the individual level at the relationship level and at the community and society level so when we talk about individual level, I, I know we heard previous attempts um, that hopelessness and or isolation, um, any mental health warning signs. Um, we talked about that racialized and historic trauma, but a history of trauma in general can be a risk for suicide. And substance use, and when we say substance use, we're not saying abuse, it could just be a change in what's normal for that youth. At the relationship level, we're really looking at four different areas. Is there current family stress or transition? Um, is there a lack of supportive relationships? That could be at the family level, that could be their friends. Um, do they have someone they can go talk to if they need to? Is there a family history of mental health issues? And are the relationships that they do have high conflict? Um, or do they have anywhere they can decompress? Or is everything just super heightened and always in a conflict mode? At the community and society level, we have, again, four different things to think about. Um, the first one is barriers to mental health services. If I'm a kiddo that needs to see somebody, can I get into a counselor? Can I see my school counselor? Um, availability of lethal means. Do I have access to um, a gun or a, my medicine cabinet? Do I have access to something that um, could be anything could, that could be considered lethal means? Um, and overt shame related to suicide and mental health issues. Wendy talked about this a little bit, but there could be a cultural component to this that it, there is a shaming component to talking about mental health issues or suicide. And then limited support and safety resources available. So just like those barriers to mental health services, do I have somewhere I can go if I need support? Um, or is that really limited in this area? When we talk about risk factors 10 and under, and I know that's a hard thing just to hear in general, right? that um, someone 10 or under could be suicidal, but we do see that. And there are some suicide, um, some suicide risk factors that we like to point out that are a little different than maybe that 10 to 24 year old age. Um, mild physical symptoms, so maybe stomach aches, headaches. Are there changes in eating or sleeping ha habits? Um, behavioral outbursts. Uh, mood changes, maybe irritability, depression, anxiety, anger, sadness, confusion. Um, is there play that involves the topic of suicide? So when they're playing with their Barbie dolls, is that something that's coming up a lot? Um, and then maybe that beginning to display impulsive actions. Um, is the child running out into the street in front of a car? So these are things that we can start to think about when we're looking at 10 and under. We can't talk about this topic currently without talking about how risk factors have been compounded potentially during COVID, right? During this pandemic. You may have seen or worked with children and youth pre-pandemic who had heightened risk factors that we just talked about with Heather, right? During the pandemic and even coming out of the pandemic, I remain hopeful, with that, we have heightened risks in the home. We have families who had to choose, do I continue to work or do I stay home and take care of my young ones who are now schooling from home, for instance. Um, food security that we had before or home insecurity that we had before, is that heightened? 
do we have less resources during the pandemic, right? So that heightened risk at home can include physical and verbal abuse. We know that um, as stress rises, anxiety rises, depression rises for our adults and caregivers, the likelihood then for physical abuse, verbal abuse also goes on the rise. Neglect, maybe parents have to be out of the home to work. And so we have young children at home or even teenagers who are left at home alone. And when Heather was talking about access to lethal means earlier, that becomes a heightened risk, right? Um, food insecurity. We know that a lot of our schools in particular uh, do a great job of having breakfast, lunches, backpacks of food for the weekends. And when the pandemic hit and schools shut down, community centers shut down, we weren't able to get those same food supplies all the time to our children and adolescents, to their homes for the weekends. I know that different schools and communities have rallied and tried to find different ways to get around that, doing home drop-offs, for instance, but that food insecurity went up, right? Um, and again, experiencing houselessness, um, not having the home that they had. We have um, multi-generational families coming back together in very small quarters. So there's higher chances of getting on each other's nerves, right? Um, which can translate into less um, safe space, less space to process how we're doing individually. Um, and all of that creates higher risks for those children and adolescents. Also, increased isolation from peers. Let's face it, we can probably remember, and if we work with children and youth now, we know that peers are everything, right? Seeing our friends, interacting. Um, I know someone who has a four-year-old and when she no longer went to preschool, she started to regress in her behaviors. The same thing is for older children as well. So with increased isolation from our social supports, our schools, our communities, we can also have heightened risk factors. And finally, just along with that lack of access to outside supports, this is where all of you come in, right? As well as your homes, as well as your community support those schools, as well as mental health services in general. How do I get my child to a counselor or a social worker or an LMFT? How do I get um, my child the physical wellness that they need, whether that's medical as well as just physically taking care of themselves? Those, um, luckily, a lot of those supports are coming back in different ways in different communities, but we have to recognize that there may be long-term effects from this. So we're going to use that chat box again. We've talked about risk factors, heightened factors. Now let's think about protective factors. What are some protective factors that you can think about um, that help our children and adolescents against suicide? Let's see if you can go ahead and do our next slide for us again. Okay. <laughs> some responses coming in here. Um, looks like Faith. Um, yes. Amy. Yes. They're coming in so fast, I have to find them. <laughs> um, <laughs> encouraging caregivers, mm -hmm. uh, coping skills, connection with others, communication, um, caring adults. That's great. Yeah, I think they did a pretty good job again, Wendy. Yes. So this is always my favorite part to talk about because we just talked about the risk factors, all the scary pieces. Now we get to talk about the building blocks. 
but are protecting and surrounding our children and adolescents. And that gets me more excited. Um, so again, we're gonna look at a handout um, that's really talking about protective factors. And when we say protective factors, we're referring to any factor that can contribute to reduced suicide risk. Um, we're looking at things that promote strength and resilience in children and adolescents that might be experiencing suicidal ideation. And so let's take a look and see what you came up with and where it matches up with the handout. So again, we're looking at this from the individual relationship and community and society level to make sure we're thinking about this systemically. And so I know increased self-esteem might have been mentioned um, or around that. I know I heard coping skills, um, cultural and spiritual beliefs, right? So someone said faith, um, ability to problem solve. So ability to take a step back and say, I'm going through a rough time. What can I do to make myself feel better? Um, so just the ability to work through and problem solve through a difficult time. Uh, sense of belongingness. So that's something that we hear a lot when we talk about suicide risk, and it can also be a protective factor. At the relationship level, we're looking at a great family support system. So when I'm having a rough day, I know I can go and talk to my parents or my uncle or my aunt or my sibling and know that I can get a um, supportive response. Um, that we have reasonable expectations from adults. And so when we're being asked to play volleyball, that there's a reasonable expectation that we're going to enjoy ourselves and there's not too much pressure being put on. So we're building that with the youth that we're talking with. Uh, positive social environment. So remember with risk factors, we were looking at um, high conflict environments. Here we're looking at positive social environments, environments that um, allow us to grow and think about things and process um, in a safe space. And with that come supportive relationships. So we have someone when we're having a rough day, we know we can go and talk to. And even if they can't make it better, they can sit with us. At the community and society level, that access to a school counselor. Um, when we're at school and we're having a rough day, we know who our school counselor is, and we know that we can go find them for support. Um, with that, access to mental health services. If we need to go see a, a clinical mental health counselor, a licensed professional counselor, I know that I can get on the phone, make an appointment for my child, and um, have them be seen in a reasonable amount of time. Um, so when we talked about access to lethal means with suicide risk, now we're talking about restriction of lethal means. So we make sure that our gun and our bullets are in separate safes um, that are apart from each other and our child doesn't know the code. Um, we have our medicine cabinets up high or with a lock on them. Um, we make sure that any chemicals in our garage are safely put away. Um, so we're just being cognizant of lethal means and making sure they're restricted in the household. And then a safe and supportive school and community environment. So do I go to school every day at a school that I know supports me and um, that I know the resources that I can get if I need them at that community level? So what can we do? We just talked about a lot of risk factors and protective factors that are helpful, but what do we do with all of those pieces? So we're really gonna present an action-oriented approach for you. This can be used by anyone at any time. It can be modified to meet your specific needs. And it's using, we're using a modified database framework adapted from my friend, Dr. Heinz. And she presented the rescue model. So the rescue model is a model that was used to identify uh, suicide and respond to it. And we're modifying that for youth today. So we're gonna look at respond, evaluate, safety, collaborate, understand, and engage for the rest of this presentation. So let's get started. So let's first talk about how we respond. There's really three main pieces here that I want you to be considering. We've talked a little bit about safe space and action, and we wanna talk about the belief. We want to take any warning signs from any child anything that they say, any verbalizations, any threats that they may make, 
or changes in behavior very seriously. I know from working with youth of all ages that sometimes it's easy to dismiss when somebody said, well, fine, I'm going to go kill myself then. Because we might have a thought that they're being very dramatic in that moment, or this is the types of language that they always use, this kind of language in their, in their home. But the piece about taking this serious is not just about in that moment, because we also know that kids test us a lot, right? Who's gonna be my safe space? How far can I push the boundary? And say that's a child's job to push the boundary and find out where it really is. If we take it seriously in the moment and really ask them about their intentions, even if they didn't really mean it in the moment, they'll remember that. And so when it is serious, they know that they can come back because you will take them serious. Or maybe if they have a friend or a family member who is serious, they'll know that you will take it serious and listen to them. So make sure that you believe in them and what they're saying to you when you're taking those warning signs seriously, right? Also that safe space. Again, we cannot highlight that enough. How do you create yourself as a safe space? and also encourage others around you to create this as a safe space where people can talk about their mental health, where people can approach you about their suicidal thoughts. And then finally, it's about taking action. Action can look very different depending on the situation. If you are working with um, a child who is telling you that they want to kill themselves or they want to harm themselves, right? Taking action can include talking with their parents, with them, right? Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. But making sure that you're willing to take action and get the people involved who need to be involved, again, whether that's a counselor, family member, um, older sibling, if you're in the school building with them, whatever that takes, um, safe space action, and believing in them. All three are equally important. Absolutely, so we've believed in them, we've created a safe place, and now we're gonna move into action. And one of the things that we can do is evaluate what is the level of suicide risk right now? And so to do that, there's a nice little um, acronym, is path warm. And so each of these different categories are areas to assess, like what's the level of risk right now? So I'm going to go to the next slide, which has some questions that you might ask, that you might ask in different ways when you're talking to this um, child or adolescent. So the first one is ideation. Does the child or adolescent present suicidal ideation? Are they saying, I wish everything was over? I, you know, I wish I wasn't here anymore. I wanna kill myself. What language are they using that's led you to evaluate in the first place? Um, substance use. Does the child or adolescent use substances? And again, is there a change or increase in substance use? So it might not look like a lot of substances for you, but maybe for that child, it is an increase in substance use. Um, and so that's just, again, that change increase is what we're looking for. Purposelessness. Does the child or adolescent feel loss of purpose? Um, are they like not wanting to maybe go to their after school program that they used to like, or they say things like, it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, does the child or adolescent exhibit signs of anxiety? Um, and is that a change in anxiety from what you normally observe with the child or adolescent? Do they feel trapped? Um, does the child or adolescent report hopelessness? Um, when we talk about hopelessness a lot, when we talk about suicide and that idea of, you know, like, I just don't care about anything anymore, that purposeless and hopelessness really connect with each other. And so if you're observing any of that with a child, that's definitely something that's a warning sign. Um, withdrawal. Have they withdrawn from social activities? So like I said, have they stopped going to basketball practice? Have they stopped texting their friends back? Have they stopped um, wanting to go out to the movies? Um, 
does the child or adolescent exhibit increased anger? And again, is that a change in anger from how they normally feel? And it's maybe it takes you off guard and it feels really different. Have they been making reckless decisions? Are they, you know, like we talked about earlier, are they running into the street? Are they not caring if they're, you know, um, if they're taking the right amount of ibuprofen, like what is reckless to that child? You would know better than anyone else. And has the child or adolescent exhibited any mood changes? Were they a pretty peppy kid and now they're just pretty solemn all the time? Uh, these are things that we can really think about as we're assessing for suicide risk it, with a child or adolescent that we're working with. And if we think there's a pretty, that there's a increased risk of suicide with a child or adolescent, we wanna provide safety. So this is our next step. The first thing we wanna do is ensure that the child or adolescent is safe. That includes developing your own plan of action. And I say develop your own plan of action before you get to the point where a child or adolescent is expressing suicide risk to you. Anyone can do this. And today's rescue model is a really great start for that. Um, having those handouts on a little magnet in your office, something that allows you to look at these things and remind you, what am I going to do if someone expresses suicidality to me? Um, if you're in a school or any community setting, know the policies and procedures of the area that you're working in. Um, or your child is in. So if your child's at a school, what it, how do they handle suicide risk? Um, know some additional resources in your local area. Um, a hotline, which we'll give you a couple of hotline numbers for national numbers at the end of this um, presentation, but there are lo usually localized numbers as well. Who's the school counselor? Um, what does the crisis support a response team look like in your area? Or what should you do if you run into somebody or you meet a kiddo for the first time and they're suicidal? Um, or is it your own child? What, what will you do? And identify at least one other safe space person. This could be a sibling or a caregiver. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that safe space person in a minute. This may or may not be you, right? And it's really important to know if you are that person for the child or adolescent. Um, and again, when we're thinking about COVID-19, that safety at home might not be guaranteed, right? And so we really need to assess what are we going to do if being safe at home isn't, um, isn't necessarily an option. So let's think about collaborating. As a safe space person, sometimes we can feel all alone in our desire to help someone, right? So I want you to be thinking about collaborating in two different ways and how we talk about safe space person. In a minute, we're going to talk about how the child is thinking about safe people in their world. But I want you to think about how you expand from you being a safe space person to having a safe space team. This is a team that not only will help the child, but also people for you to um, feel connected to and know that there's going to be a response team in place, right? Um, sometimes it can feel very isolating and we want you to make sure you don't feel alone in this process as well, right? So when you are thinking about your safe space team, in a minute, I'm gonna be asking you to brainstorm who those people are for you, as well as maybe for a child that you're working with. In the meantime, I want you to be thinking about this idea of confidentiality. So for some of us who are mandated reporters or because of our professional ethics, we know and we're taught when we have to break confidentiality. One of those reasons is when a child is talking about suicide. Either they've attempted, they're self-harming, or they have a plan and a serious plan, right? But some, not all of us are in that situation. And we need to think about how we break confidentiality in a way where we still remain in alliance as a safe space person with the child that we're working with. 
it's really important to create buy-in with a child. Now, you know this from just general, anything that you need to do, right? Getting the child to go with you to the grocery store. Sometimes you need buy-in from them to go and help you with the shopping, right? Maybe it's a treat at the end or they get a call their friend at the end. Some people would call that bribing. I call it buy-in, right? Okay. But the idea with breaking confidentiality and getting buy-in from a child or adolescent is the hope that if they are disclosing to you that they want to commit suicide, you talk with them about how you're going to break confidentiality. And sometimes that's as simple as saying, do you want to call dad or do you want me to call dad? It's not, should we call dad or mom or grandma, whoever the primary caregiver is. It's who's going to make the call. Do you want to call them or should we ask them to come meet us here at the community center and we'll tell them together. So you are a partner in this, you're an ally for them, particularly if they're scared to tell their caregiver because we were talking about those cultural values previously. Maybe they're afraid that they won't be believed or it'll be you know, blown out of proportion, whatever that could be, right? When we're talking about suicide. But we want them to, we wanna get their buy-in, right? To go ahead and be the one to tell the caregiver themselves, if at all possible, because their words are important. If they're not willing to tell, and we need to tell their primary caregiver, we need to be upfront that we're going to do that. They can have choice how we do that. That's the difference, right? And we'll talk a little bit more about, um, on the next slide, we have a worksheet we're gonna work through on talking about those safe space people and who do we break confidentiality with. We also need to understand and follow our protocols in our community agencies, um, hospitals, outpatient care facilities, as well as our schools. If you work within a school or community setting, Find out what your protocol is. Heather talked a little bit about this earlier. I know every new school that I work with, one of the things I have to make myself do is look at that school manual. And it feels very dry, but the first thing I do is go to the crisis section. And what do we do in crisis in our school, right? Sometimes our schools don't have those plans yet. So you can be the advocate helping to create that culture of wellness and mental health in your school to help draft and create that plan for your school so that other people can become safe space mem members or know that you're the safe space member and they know how you will take action. And then finally, think about something we call wraparound services. Who is the primary caregiver working with the child? Who's the school mental health professional? So in my case, I was the school counselor, so that was me. You might also have a school psychologist or school social worker, but make sure you know who the whole um, team is that's going to be working on behalf of the child. Okay, so here's our safe space people worksheet. We have a little bit of time, so I want you to be thinking about this, right? So first, just as yourself, I want you to be thinking about, um, and if you have a piece of paper near you, you can draw this out, but think about who are the safe space people in your world? So maybe that's a significant other, maybe that's a sibling, maybe that's a neighbor, maybe that's your best friend, Heather, Maybe that's your other best friend, Amber. And I want you to think about who are the people that you would talk to if you had uh, suicidal thoughts, if you were concerned about your mental health and well being. Because we have different people in our lives, and some people will talk about some things, and some people will talk about other things with. Okay. So, who do you feel safe with? Who would you keep in contact with? You might place different people at different distances from yourself. Well, I'll trust Amber with the really hairy, scary things, but I'll trust Heather with my shopping fails and I need to do a return for that. We have different people with different needs, right? So now I want you to think about using this worksheet with the child that you're concerned about. And 
if you're like me, there's no budget anywhere. So crayons or markers or pencils and a sheet of paper work just fine for this. No high tech needed, right? If you do talk to Caitlin, she will be your tech person to create this online. So how I would use this is with my youth, I have them in charge and they put themselves in the center of the paper. Who are you? And then I want you to think about some safe space people in your world and how much you trust them. And the closer you put them to you in the center of the paper is, the, is how much closer you trust that individual, right? So we can use this to identify the people who we feel the most safe with, right? With our big, hairy, scary secrets, with our trust issues, who we're willing to look inside, right? Our private thoughts. And also who, who would we be willing to be contacted, right? By our caregivers, or by our school counselors, or our teachers, or our youth group leaders, if there's a problem. So for instance, when I have a child finish this, I can look at this very quickly. And in this example, I can see that neighbor Kim is actually closer to this child than maybe dad or mom, right? Well, it's not that we only tell neighbor Kim what's going on, but we tell mom and dad, hey, you have some other safe space people that your child is really drawn to and trust. And I would encourage you to bring them into that wraparound service of people who can keep an eye, eye on your child, right? Because maybe they'll tell Kim some things that they're not ready to tell mom. Because in this diagram, for instance, we don't have a close relationship with mom right now, but we do neighbor Kim. This is important and powerful information for both mom and dad, right? So how the child create this in a way that then they're willing to share with their primary caregivers, because we do have to break confidentiality. And this is one of our ways we can talk to them about who we're willing to talk to about what we're scared about or our suicidal thoughts or our risky behaviors, right? Okay. Wonderful. And so once we've identified those safe spaces and collaborated with the kiddo, now we're trying to really understand what's going on. So when we're understanding, we're really looking to provide space. And in that space, we want to listen to immediate what's going on right this very second in the here and now and long term concerns. What are concerns in the future that our kiddo is worried about? And we want to validate those feelings. It's a lot for anyone to talk about any type of mental health struggles. And we want to always make sure that we're validating as opposed to invalidating things that our, our um, child or adolescent is saying. It's important to acknowledge experiences, no matter how small they may seem. A fight with their best friend may not feel like a big deal to you, but it could be the biggest deal to them. We really wanna focus on empathy as opposed to sympathy. And I know we hear about these words a lot. And so let me give you a couple examples of sympathetic responses, and then let's talk about intentional empathic responses. So with sympathy, we really wanna avoid sympathy phrases when we're talking to a child and adolescent. Here's a couple examples. It's not the worst thing that can happen to you. You'll be fine tomorrow. Don't be so dramatic. Have we all heard those things a few times said to us? <laughs> I have. So what happens when we use pra we practice using intentional empathic responses? So these look like, I can't imagine what you're going through. Let's stay in this space for a moment so I can hear you out. Tell me more about that. I'm listening. When we give space for an, um, using empathy, we're more likely to get those open-ended responses from the child or adolescent and not close up based on um, feelings that we're having. So we really wanna take that moment and um, make that safe space that we've been talking a lot about during this presentation. When we use sympathetic responses, like it's not the worst thing that could happen to you, you'll be fine for tomorrow. It might close the child or adolescent up 
during that moment, but also in future moments when they may be feeling worse or they may be like, that's not a safe space person that I want to come talk to. Whereas if you open that space up, I can't imagine what you're going through. Tell me more about that. I'm listening. You're giving space for the child and adolescent to work through some pretty complicated feelings with you. And that's really important. So practice that in your day, in, your, in the next couple of days. Try using empathy instead of sympathy and see how your responses might change. And finally, we want to engage with our child or adolescent. This is really beginning the next steps. Um, after you've identified suicide risk, you've also identified the safe people in their life, you've given them space with empathic responses, um, you've believed them, you've um, you validated what they're feeling, you've given action. Now we're really going to the next steps of that. And remember, action is always better than inaction. If in doubt, act and you know work through something in an open way. And um, that child or adolescent will always be thankful for that, as opposed to saying, I'm going to deal with that tomorrow if they're still feeling that way. This is when the therapeutic process begins. And this might happen with a school counselor, with a clinical mental health counselor. There's so many different people that might start this therapeutic process. And you may be the only person that's following up on this process for that kiddo. Um, that can be overwhelming. And it's also important to know if you're not the primary caregiver, the primary caregiver may not be able to be that main source of support for the kiddo. Um, and they may need their own therapeutic resources and processes. And so if you're, say, the school bus driver and you run into this kiddo, or you're the neighbor, your neighbor Kim from our Safe Space Worksheet, you may be that person that's following up on the process. Um, what we want to do is build that Safe Space People Worksheet up. So we want to increase the support system around a child or adolescent so that you're not the only person that the child has to go with, that they have supportive people and maybe they have that written down on who, who do they go to if they're going through something difficult. Um, we also want to think about aftercare planning. So when we talk about aftercare planning, it's maybe that might be after a suicide attempt. It might be just after you've went through um, suicidal ideation with a student or a kiddo, a child or adolescent. And that might be with their primary caregiver. It might be with their counselor, with their school counselor. But what are we going to do that's purposeful and continuous um, and thoughtful? So do we know what's going to happen with the kiddo a week from now? How are we going to assess how things are going two weeks from now, a month from now? Really spending that time um, going through what what we need to do to increase the um, protective factors and the support around the child. And connecting that child or adolescent support system with resources. You hear this a lot, but no one's an island. And we want to look at connecting and making sure we have that web of support around a child or adolescent. Because if you are that only person following up on the process, that's pretty exhausting for you. And it's exhausting for the child or adolescent, too. So the more we can build that support around them, um, the better everybody's going to feel. And finally, it's important to remember that a one-size-fits-all approach does not work. When we talked about those risk factors and protective factors, I said, these are just some examples. They're not the be-all, end-all. These are not the only things we're looking at. It's the same with treatment and with working with a child or adolescent after suicidal ideation. No one size fits all is going to work with every child or adolescent. And you as their person um, knows, knows that kiddo better than most others. And you'll know what size fits for that child. So as we sum up today, um, going back to the chat box, are there any final thoughts? Um, I know as Heather was talking there at the end, I was thinking about how can we use some of those resources today? The is path warm? How can we as 
um, the safe space person who joined us today use that ourselves. But how can we use those risk factors and protective factors to maybe help educate others as we're building that culture of wellness and mental health in our communities and schools? How can we use that safe space worksheet or maybe give that to the parent to use with their child to draw out themselves? Um, so how can we use those different resources with different individuals? Um, we're also going to put up a slide with some resources here at the end. So while you're putting in your final thoughts in, um, in the chat box about maybe what worked best for you today or um, what you look forward to using, or if you have any questions, we can do that. And then just also know that these selected resources are there for you and also for you to share with others to be using through this process. Wonderful. Thank you so much. This information was wonderful. Uh, we do have a few questions popping up, so I'll sure. read some of those for you. Um, so someone was asking about um, the book 13 Reasons Why, um, which was also a Netflix show, and yeah. kind of wondering your thoughts on that. Um, is the book a good resource or you know, any research related to that? That's such a good question. I think that's complicated. Um, I know that after the TV show came out, um, People were concerned by the length um, in suicide attempts, I believe, um, after watching it. I, I think it goes back to that, like, I like using plain language. I like being real with a child or adolescent. I think it really depends on the age and um, what's the purpose of using that. I think there's a lot of great resources that um, maybe aren't as... Um, I don't even know the word to use. Um, I, I hate the word sensationalized, but it is kind of a sensationalized book and movie. Um, I don't know if that would be my first recommended piece as opposed to just having a conversation about it using that plain language and um, having a discussion. We also know that kids are going to watch it. Um, it was a really popular show. It lasted for multiple seasons. So um, I think, I would say like just thinking about how would you talk to them about 13 reasons why if it came up as opposed to using it as a tool um, before they watched it. Wendy, I don't know if you have anything to add to that. No, I think um, Heather, you hit on so much of that. And again, it's about using plain language, but it's also about being aware of what's out there in pop culture, um, being yeah. aware of, of what children have access to um, and seeing that um, and watching through it or reading through it so that you know what lens they're, they're working from. I would also say, um, you know, we see a lot of sensationalization of suicides when they happen in popular culture. And um, I, I think reporters have gotten a lot better about the way they talk about it, but it is something you're going to have to face head on with a kiddo. So just thinking about like, how might I talk to my child about what suicide means and um, making it something that is something they feel like they can talk to you about when they don't understand why their favorite celebrity died by suicide. Like that's something that I think is a worthwhile piece to talk about. And again, varies from child to child. Um, kind of a, a related question here is when we're doing aftercare planning, um, how can you go about that without blaming or punishing or you know using language that might feel blaming? I think that goes back to that empathy versus sympathy conversation, right? Like, I think really practicing our empathic statements, like, that must have been so hard for you. Tell me about how you were feeling, right? So coming from a place of understanding as opposed to judgment. And I, I'll say that takes practice. Um, uh, I know how I act as a counselor with my clients might be different than how I'd act with my sister, right? Or my brother or my cousin. And so sometimes we have to practice that empathic language and know that using fix it language of like, how could you do that? That hurt me. Like, don't do that again. 
that might make us feel better in the moment, but long term, that's not really opening up that conversation. Whereas using those empathic statements, like tell me more about what you were feeling, that must have been devastating for you, um, tends to go a lot further. Wendy? And and those empathic statements leave the door open for the next time that um, they're feeling suicidal because the first time isn't the last time, right? We know that. Mm -hmm. Heather, one of the statistics you were giving is for every sui completed suicide, there's 100 to 200 attempts. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, and so um, we also know that some people will try more than once right and the lethality can change over time so we want to re remove those judgments we want to remove that blaming or shaming because we need them to have a safe space to go to mm -hmm. to talk about it the next time they're feeling that way um do you have any information or resources related to the rates of ideation or attempts for children on the autism spectrum Mm. I do not have that. I don't know that I've ever seen. That. I can certainly look um, and send something um, to the webinar host, um, but that is not a statistic that I've ever seen. I know different popul. There are certain populations that are at increased risk. I've never seen that for um, children with autism. I know that like. Um, Individuals in the LGBTQ community have a higher risk of suicide. I know trans youth, um, trans population in general, um, there's a 50% risk of suicide in that population, but I haven't ever um, seen anything specifically of children with autism. And we can follow up with a little bit of information there too. Yeah. Um, how about children who maybe just have an interest in like discussing death or just have yeah. questions about death? Is that considered a risk factor or is that just kind of a developmental sequence? I think that can be very developmental. I think that it's completely natural to think about something that's going to happen to everyone in the world, right? And um, I think there's different ways you know, are they talking about death when they're severely depressed? Um, are there other, going back to those risk factors and those building blocks of protective factors, um, what are the different pieces that you're seeing? If they're just having a conversation about death, I think that can be very normal and healthy. Um, Wendy, what do you think? Exactly. It's very natural. Sometimes we like to think, especially younger children, they don't think about these heady questions right that we as adults do but they certainly process what happens to us when we die especially if there's been a death in the family or mm -hmm. there's been a, a child that they know that has died or been affected by death that will spur on these kinds of conversations um, anniversaries of a loved one's death particularly the first one can be a um a child may not even know that they're really aware that they're thinking about or or processing about death, why they're doing it then until later, right? They look at the calendar um, mm -hmm. or the first Christmas without a loved one. So in particular, that tends to be a heightened type time where children talk about grief and loss. If there are heightened risk factors associated with mm -hmm. that, that's I think then when we clue in a little closer, but allowing them to process that is normal and okay. And important, right? Yes. Yeah. And their ideas as, as children get older, their ideas about the world shift and change, and we need to be aware of that as well, right? So our ideas of death and dying, our ideas of why do we matter in this world, all of that will continue to shift and change. So again, it's not a one-off um, conversation. Okay. There one last question I want to get to. Um, we have a school counselor who talks about working with um, parents and how one of the struggles is often, you know, when parents are a little resistant to reach out, um, to get resources. Do you have any recommendations for working with parents who just aren't very responsive? Mm -hmm. hmm. Wendy, do you want to go with that one first and I can add on? Sure. 
Um, first of all, I think an in-person conversation, if you can manage that, goes so much further. Um, and I, I know school counselors, we get really good at reading the room and reading the energy of the person that we're talking to. Um, and seeing someone face-to-face -face if you can, and just starting with how do you feel about what's going on? Um, really getting them to process what their values are around the ideas of suicide can then help the second conversation of how do we get others involved? And it's similar to when I was talking about with the child with um, breaking confidentiality. It's not, will we break confidentiality? It's not, will we seek outside services? It's how will we seek outside services? Who do we want to involve in this process? Mm -hmm. How can we create a bigger safe space network to get you the services that you need as well as your child? We also talked previously about you the safe space person and maybe that's the parent how do we get you services and support for what you're going through and really helping them know that we're there to support them as well but it will happen that's that's yeah. not a question right that's not an option it will happen how do we want to do it and i think too just that normalizing these feelings on both sides normalizing what the child's going through to yes. the parents but also normalizing that reticence from the parents and acknowledging that you understand where they're coming from and here's why we have to act anyway, right? Um, I think just, I, I liked what you said, Wendy, about just making that face-to-face -face meeting, which is not always possible, but always, you know, preferable. And just, I think validating their feelings as much as you're validating the feelings of the students while also reframing those feelings to be like this is this is what we have to do right now and this is why what your child's going through is totally okay and working through that using that empathic statement yeah. piece with the parent first you know before we get started how are you doing exactly i can't imagine how tough this must be for you and you're modeling when you're doing that, right? You're modeling for the parent on how they might talk to their kiddo. A lot of, a lot of parents say, oh, this must be my fault. We need to remove some of that shame and guilt to yeah. move forward. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I see we are right at time, so we'll be respectful to everyone's time. Um, if there was a question out there that we didn't get to, please feel free to follow up with our speakers. I'm sure they'd be very happy to continue the conversation. Um, just for you two, we have lots of comments in here about the handouts were wonderful. They love the information. So thank you for sharing your time with us. Um, and as a reminder, please fill out our survey so we can get you more great webinars like this in the future. And with that, have a wonderful rest of your day. Great.